Hey, this is Nate Wells. And this is Drew Cove. Check out our podcast, that Go For Hockey podcast, for uh, the latest news and updates on University of Minnesota Hockey. You can find us on uh, iTunes, and we're also on the uh, Zone Coverage Podcast Network. That's elite. The Zone Coverage Podcast Network. They may be drinkers, Robin, but they're also human beings. Hell yeah, let's get Stinko. in the goalie podcast for some unbeknownst reason to us we are back coming to you from (laughs) our old home our unnamed bar and grill in roseville our beloved i am your host giles farrell whose twitter just alerted him that giles farrell just tweeted (laughs) well that's good to know Twitter really killing it with the notifications now <laughs> here in 2018. Uh, that is the laughter of Ben Remington. Hello. Find him on Twitter at Ben Remington. Pretty easy. Don't follow him on Twitter because he's wearing a Colorado Avalanche jersey. We'll get to that. <laughs> uh, and then the stars have aligned for <laughs> Drew Cove of the Gopher Hockey Podcast. To join the Giles and the Goalie podcast. Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, you know, had an interesting night so We're, far. Yeah, but it's good it's, to be here. It's I think it was, it's the here. gravitational pull of unnamed bar and grill in Roseville that just yeah. We we try to we try to get out and it just pulls us back in. Hey, I mean, we moved from our initial plan of being in Minneapolis to not being in Minneapolis. Hey, we are on the we are on the right side of 280. I yeah. will say that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Tom. Hi. Not sorry. We have a spectator. <laughs> Does that really count? <laughs> no. She's just here for me. I don't know why they keep why she keeps coming back. Oh, okay, yeah. She's here for the beer. That's fine. Good call. Yeah. I'd be only here for the alcohol too. Yeah. Why don't you try a sip of that? <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway, I apologize. Uh, so it is exciting to have Drew with us as uh he has uh, a lot of Jersey taste that we are most definitely going to get to uh, later in the show. We're going to save the best for last. Yeah. Uh, as he wears, uh, we uh, to preview what we're going to talk about later, we're going to talk about the 2010 jerseys, and we might come back around if uh, time allows. We're going to come back to the 2000s that uh, we were so uh, lacking in uh, last week's show <coughs> as uh, <coughs> Ben uh, s- <coughs> has so many regrets about. The beef. Uh, <laughs> So that's uh, that's what we're going to do. Drew is wearing his uh, finest jersey of the 2000s in the St. Louis Blues, TJ Oshie jersey. Ah. Yep. Uh, ben didn't follow suit. I'm rocking the uh, Alex Ovechkin uh, throwback Washington Capitals mm-hmm. jersey uh, that debuted here this uh, this decade. So that's uh, that's how we're rolling with you here uh, on whatever day you're listening to this. Otherwise, fine <laughs> production. I usually say this evening, but I don't know when you're going to listen to this. So. I would think probably during the day, uh, people work yeah. and that kind of. I, when I used to listen to a lot of podcasts, it was during the day. So nobody nightcaps with the Giles and the Goalie podcast. <laughs> well, <laughs> some unfortunate souls probably do, but but you're grateful well, for their listeners. Yeah, right? some people there nightcap with the host of the Giles and the Goalie podcast. They just don't <laughs> well. nightcap with the Giles and the Goalie podcast. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. Uh, okay. So Minnesota Wild had. Uh, an interesting week. Yeah. They uh, they were coming off back-to-back uh, abysmal losses to the Calgary Flames and the Edmonton Oilers, and we, we sounded the swoon alarm yeah. on the last show. It's an official uh, swoon. We officially dubbed it a swoon. Did we give it a name? No. No, we did not. I, we didn't, I don't think we got to that, that far because it had just become like the, the criteria was seven losses in ten games, and they had just hit that mark with that loss on uh, Friday. And boy, they, they stuck the landing on that seventh loss, too. So uh, that was, uh, yeah. So we hadn't got around to actually naming it. but If you have any good names for it, <laughs> uh, tweet at the Giles and the Goalie podcast. Right. Well, now um, that it's kind of over, I guess we could name it posthumously. But 
Well, we'll see. <laughs> there was a lot left. I mean, there see. was there was there was two wins and then a loss. So let's yeah yeah fair fair. Let's 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 not get too ahead of ourselves here. But uh, Tuesday, the Wild returned home to kick off a four-game homestand. Mm-hmm. Uh, they hosted the Montreal Canadiens, mm-hmm. Le Bleu, mm-hmm. and uh, they roasted the Montreal Canadiens seven to one at XL Energy Center. Yeah, poor Auntie Niemi didn't know what hit him. Shades of uh, Mr. Roy. <laughs> <laughs> I almost <laughs> made a joke. Him out to die. Yeah, I almost <laughs> made a joke about that late in the game. Like, man, they better pull Niemi, otherwise he's going to force a trade to the Avalanche. It's really yeah. going to screw over the Canadians because. They're just hanging them out to dry there. They, so they probably wasn't them. on the bench for the Wild. Yeah, that game, right? <laughs> exactly. They ended up pulling them eventually. So there was that was the good news for poor Auntie Niemi. But does anybody know what he's doing now? Who? It's Mario Tremblay. Is he just retired with well, Jack? Sure he is. He's, he's got to be what seventy? Is he somebody special advisor? Yeah. Probably. Ooh. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure he's. Who knows? No. He's seen better days. <laughs> uh, goals from Nito Niederreiter, Matt Dumba, Charlie Coyle, Eric Stahl, Jared Spurgeon. Matt Dumba again and Zach Parisi. Everyone gets a goal. Unless you're Matt Dumba. Then you score twice. Then you get two. Yeah, then you get two. Uh, but uh, just an absolute uh, uh, butt whooping. And uh, what hopefully uh, was what the Wild needed to uh, kind of cleanse their palate and uh, get back onto the winning ways. And they showed that again on Thursday. They hosted the Florida Panthers. Uh, and again, 5-1 to one they win. So two games at home. They outscore their... Kind of lackluster opponents yeah. by a score of 12 to 2. Goals from Nino Niederreiter times 2. Eric Stahl, Zach Parisi, and Jonas Brodin via a slap shot. Yeah. What? I, w- I was actually in attendance at that game. Oh. I was. Uh, I indulged myself in some cassettes. Another uh, <laughs> great, That's good. tremendous uh, St. Paul tradition. Um, no, yeah, but the uh, that game looked. I mean, from the get go, was a little slow. Yeah. I mean, from watching at home too, uh, you could probably tell. I yeah. mean. Giving up the first goal and getting up five straight, but I mean, Stahl whiffed on a goal early on, and yeah, they weren't very good at the start. Yeah, but I mean, Nino's had, having a good stretch. Yeah, yeah, Nino's really heating up, and that's great to see. Because uh, man, that guy just to start the season was was pretty snake bitten. I mean, shooting percentage was, I mean, it was zero for the longest time because it took a while to get that first goal. But uh, it's just really been kind of an abysmal percentage for a while now. So it's good to see that kind of. That that negative regression can thing kind of take over, and, and him really connecting on a lot of stuff, and and that line with him and uh, Coyle and Parisi has been just absolutely incredible. Uh, this last week, especially the first, you know, the the three games this week, they've been pretty good. So yeah, and then after the game, Zach Parisi was just openly pleading for Bruce Pedro to not split up the line if Miko Koivu <laughs> returned. <laughs> right, and then he did it on Saturday. Yeah. Speaking of sp- Saturday, we're going to spend a few minutes on that game. There was a fight, and a hockey game broke out. Uh, the Calgary Flames visited the XL Energy Center in a rematch from uh, nine days prior when the uh, Wild host when the Wild visited the Calgary Flames, and uh, we had the extracurricular activities at the end with uh, Matt Dumba and his very disrespectful hit <laughs> on uh, whatever the hell his name was. Backlund. Uh, yeah, M- Mikhail Backlund. Bob, La- yeah, Bob, and then Bob got, Backlund. And he got jumped. Um, so. To start the game, we we had some fights. Uh, what was that? Mark Mark Giordano went at Matt Dumba. Was that? No, it uh, was Matthew Kachuk. It was yeah, it was Matthew, Matthew Kachuk, Kachuk went after Dumba. Forty seconds into the hockey game, yeah. Matthew Kachuk went at Matt Dumba, and we never really saw Matt Dumba after that first period. Yeah, he he hit the ice after that for a little while, and then there was another incident where I believe he got kind of jostled or, or kind of poked at by. Um, yeah, the guy that Suter ended up fighting. Um, I forget who it was. But Sam Bennett. Yeah, Bennett. That's right. So, yeah, Bennett kind of didn't go after him, didn't tackle him or anything, but kind of gave him a, uh, you know, kind of a nudge as to I still think that you're disrespectful or whatever the line of crap that we're getting from the Flames is. And, yeah, so and we didn't see Dumb after that at all. So I, I'm sure there wasn't a re-aggravation, but it, whatever, you know, something happened somewhere there in that first period, whether it be the fight or something else, uh, where Dumba literally didn't leave the locker room after the first intermission. So, um, you know, not a lot is known. Uh, in true podcast fashion, we're going to find out <laughs> tomorrow Monday. after the show is released uh, what's wrong with Matt Dumba. But, uh, you know, it, it feels like they dodged a bullet a little bit with Koivu's injury where he was only out, you know, it'll end up being not even two weeks. And that's pretty good considering how serious that injury could have been. 
Dumba, oh, you kind of hope for the same thing. Hopefully it's nothing too serious. Hopefully it's nothing that holds him up for too long because that guy is, uh, I mean, talk about Nino being hot. Matt Dumba is is just as hot right now and leads the NHL in defensive, defenseman goals. So There were three different fights in the first period alone. Yeah. Culminating with Ryan Suter and Sam Bennett fighting <laughs> yeah. with 90 seconds left in the first period. Yeah. Ryan was... Suter. <laughs> Well, they, yeah, they came from Bennett, like I said, jostling Dumba, and Suter took yeah. exception to it and went after him. And um, You know, none of those fights, being as somebody who actually somewhat enjoys fighting, uh, none of those fights were any good. They weren't even anything worth watching. There was a lot of hugging, a lot of helmet tapping, and it just wasn't anything that was even worth anybody's time. And that's probably the most disappointing part of it is to say that these were fights that were, you know, a, a more of these staged uh Variety where they didn't need to happen, and it was all just kind of this residual crap from that last game they played. And uh, you know, I ranted about it last week about how stupid it was that Calgary was actually mad at Matt Dumba, and it all kind of stems from that. Like all of these fights stemmed from that, and it's just absolutely ridiculous. And so I don't know. There, there's only so much you can say about that, but it was just it was just silliness. In the actual hockey part of the game that was played, <laughs> uh, Mark Giordano scored the first period. Jordan Greenway tied the game with a tremendous snipe in the second period. Uh, but then uh, midway through the third, Matthew Kachuk uh, scores the game-winning goal. Wild lose 2-1 to one in regulation of the Calgary Flames. No Miko Koivu and no Jason Zucker who was out with an illness uh, for the, the 12.30 afternoon start. Yeah. Uh, and so, quick roundtable. Do you enjoy the twelve thirty afternoon starts on a Saturday? Yeah, I think it's great. Uh, it was it was nice because had a friend's birthday party later later that night and was able to go out and have several uh, fashionable adult beverages and um, without any kind of inter- interference at all about watching watching the hockey game. So yeah, it was great. Um, I. I tend to like the later games on Saturdays. I like the Sunday matinees where they're kind of, I mean, that's just a little nicer. I like to like, be able to do like stuff during the day on my Saturdays generally, but sure. I don't know. And I, I mean, if Tom were here, you know, he'd be like, well, it's a little past Drew's bedtime, isn't it? Late <laughs> night, those late night Saturday games, but uh, you know, my parents let me stay up late for some of those games. So, <laughs> so now you got, you got lucky because it, there was a considerable portion of the day drew that tom was actually slated to be the producer of this otherwise fine show really and then then he bailed on us he uh, he he tagged off to uh, another producer and then and then we ended up here somehow ended up here (laughs) i'd like to quote just a recent tweet classic tom yeah Yeah. classic Classic tom Tom. yeah classic Classic tom Tom. but uh so we kind of went over the matt dumba injury but I'm going to sound off a little bit on the uh, the Calgary first period at least because I'm I'm with you I I still think there's a place for fighting in hockey. Yeah. I'm not ready to just throw it out altogether. Sure. But what we saw in the first period on Saturday was absolute garbage. That doesn't have a place in the game. The code or whatever the hell it is that the the players seemingly live by, quote unquote, that's crap. Mm-hmm. And going at Matt Dumba for a perfectly legal hit while he was trying to step up and make a play to, uh, you know, try to score a goal in the late minutes of a hockey game. There's no disrespect there. The disrespect on the ice was. The Flames going after Matt Dumba on Saturday for a a hit that was well within the rules of the game. And mm-hmm. don't give me your BS line about disrespect when that's what you do for a first period is you just goon around. Mm-hmm. Don't don't give me that crap. That that's not what I pay to see. When I I pay to see hockey games. I pay to see the best players play hockey. I don't pay to see a WWE fight break out. <laughs> you might pay for that. I would. I yes. don't. Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. It, it was, uh, and the thing is too, it's like if you look at the initial Calgary game, who got suspended? Not Matt Dumba. Mark Giordano and Dip Lombard got suspended because they were the ones that were in the wrong. I mean, Lum, you know, Lombard was the guy 
out there doing his best Bertuzzi impression by jumping Dumbo from behind when he wanted nothing to do with him. And uh, Giordano's the one going knee on knee with Koivu. Granted, he apologized later, you know, via text or whatever. And that's great. And that's fine. You know, things happen in a hockey game. I understand that. But if you're the Flames, you're 100% in the wrong here. And, you know, we, we do not, not to give NHL Department of Player Safety the making them the be-all, end-all decision makers on <laughs> whether things are clean or not because, you know, they've certainly left Tom Wilson unscathed a few more times than they should have so far this season. But, I mean, it, you know, it was pretty universally accepted that Dumba's hit was clean and that the, he did nothing wrong. And, you know, the whole disrespect card, as our friend of the podcast, Derek Peterson, pointed out, or no, it wasn't him. It was, uh, I believe it was Alex Schmidt, uh, former hockey wilderness writer, Calgary had a two-goal comeback in the last minute just this week. Just this week. They, Such disrespect. They, they came back from a game where they were down two goals in the last minute. Exactly the situation that Matt Dumbo was in when he when he, when he he knocked out a player with his head down. It's just it's so ridiculous. Got any hot opinions on that, Drew, or <laughs> are you just going to leave at that to I us? can't say. I know I didn't see that part of the Flames game, so... Can't, I, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to jump in when uh, I don't know the full, the full, the full scope of the situation. It's called here. third man in, is what I that had, is. That's a penalty. <laughs> I had the, f- I had the first period on in the background. I, so now because I have a significant other, I have two Christmases. Oh, so, that's that's terrible. Yeah, I know. It's just, <laughs> just awful. So I was cooking Christmas dinner during the first period. So. Fortunately for me, I didn't see a whole lot of it, but went back and I looked at the tape, and it, you know, like you said, you know, a a hockey game broke out at a fighting match. Right. Yep. But I didn't miss much. The roast beef was exquisite, by oh, the way. Oh, okay. So this was your Minnesota Christmas this past weekend, then? Yeah. What do you guys do for Iowa Christmas? Is that just a lot of staring at corn? Or yeah, we're on some what? corn. You no, know, you go out in the field really? itself. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Talk about the latest Iowa versus we, Iowa State matchup. Talk about Casey's ranch. Oh, yes. We actu- <laughs> Casey's we actually, pizza. Yeah. We actually did watch the latest Iowa versus Iowa State basketball <laughs> game. It was on in my home. <laughs> Catered by Casey's Pizza. Yep. Okay. <laughs> makes sense. Okay. Sounds Brought about right. to you by Iowa Corn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> we, were, we were probably done with that game anyway. We've yeah, ranted enough yeah, on how stupid that first period was. So, coming out of the week, the Wild won two games pretty convincingly, and then they kind of got savaged by injuries in the third, and yeah. it wasn't really a hockey game. So, you kind of brought it up earlier, but do you think they are out of the swoon? I, I think so. Um you also got to keep in mind, Calgary is suddenly the best team in the West, which, when the hell did that happen? It's all those <laughs> trades with Carolina in the yeah. offseason that did it. <laughs> it's, it is. It's all, yeah, uh, so I, I don't know exactly what, you know, it, it, it's a shame, actually, because had the Wild had the full complement of stars, Dumba, Koivu, Zucker, it's probably a different hockey game, right? Like, that's probably, you know, they probably make a little bit more of a battle of it, <clears throat> Um Against again the best team in the Western Conference, yeah. uh, to go with two obviously in- incredibly convincing wins against lower opponents. Uh, but I, I think one of the biggest things is that Dubnik finally looks right again. I mean he he uh, he looked really solid in both the blowouts. Obviously he didn't have much to do, um, but against Calgary he looked fine. Um, you know the game winning goal was something that I don't think you know you pointed out when you made the gift of it. I don't think he saw it. I, I mean it was really there was a lot of traffic in front of him. And uh, the Giordano goal, the, the shorthanded goal, to, to Giordano's credit, that was a hell of a move. And he really, I mean, he went absolutely bar down on, on Dubnik and, and roofed that shot. It was just a really nice move. You just got to tip your cap. So I, I think for those reasons, I think because they were they went toe-to-toe, shorthanded against one of the best teams in the West, and Dubnik seems like he's, you know, put whatever issues he had behind him, I think they're okay now. Does that mean that they're, you know, going to reel off a bunch of wins in a row? No, not necessarily. But I think that the prolonged losing streak is, you know, going to be a little more spotty now. I, I that's what I think at least. I still have a few reservations. <laughs> I, I'm not quite ready to say Dubnik's turned the corner. He did have a very good week, but 
he could just simply go back to what he was before in the next sure. week. Sure. Just, just as easily. So I'm looking for a little bit more prolonged uh, stretch of solid play from him. Yeah. And then the bottom six has really kind of taken a step back for Minnesota here in the last week and change or two weeks. Since Koi Moo got hurt. Really, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it kind of even started a little bit before that, but, you know, when you have Koi Vu there, it's not that not as noticeable. But sure. it's a couple of weeks ago I praised, you know, that Eric Fears and JT Browns and, you know, Matt Hendricks for being such good acquisitions, and now the, the bottom six has kind of dried up a, a little bit here. So... Mm-hmm. And when the top guys aren't scoring and your bottom six isn't producing, then that gives you kind of what you had against Calgary, where you you're kind of needing you know otherworldly goals from Jordan Greenway to get on the scoreboard, and you're otherwise getting blanked by something called David Riddick, <laughs> the Chronicles of Riddick. So I, I I still have some reservations on that, but you're probably closer to right that there are signs pointing to they're out of the swoon but i'm not quite ready to declare them uh, swoon free here as uh we'll still say we're in swoon watch <laughs> well and still that doesn't mean watch. if they're out of the swoon it doesn't mean that they're completely out of the woods you know dumba's injury is going to be huge because we'll right. see what happens we don't know how long how much out we get out of miko koivu coming back well we got to see what happens on that because who knows if he's 100 percent you know, that knee injury looks so brutal. Him coming back after two weeks is kind of surprising. Yeah, so. didn't he have knee surgery, what, a year or two ago at this point? Uh, he was out for a considerable time. And maybe it was an ankle or something. It really affected his skating right away. That's what I remember way back. It might have been a while ago. Yeah, it was yeah. a couple of seasons ago, I think. And the Wild upcoming this week, they have San Jose at home to finish a homestand. Then they go to Pittsburgh where they had never play well. Yeah. Ever. And then they come back home before the holiday break starts, and they play the Dallas Stars, who are slowly starting to get their their act together. Sure. So no, no easy stretch. Oh, I'm so sorry. Dallas has lost four in a row. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. I apologize. They're back to Dallas. Yeah. I I last time I checked on the Stars, they were starting to get it together, but clearly I haven't checked in it. They we dropped the ball. So yeah. So never mind. But. No, no small task for the Wild this week to to pull it around. So, you hope that they they can keep the that momentum going from the last week. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I still have reservations. That's fair. Yeah, well, understandable. You're supposed to argue with me. No, I. I mean, <laughs> I did. I said that I think they're out of the woods. I, you know, I. I don't think that. The, like I said, the non, that just because they're out of the swoon doesn't necessarily mean they're about to reel off. You know. 12 wins straight in a row like they did a couple Decembers ago. Like, that's not necessarily the case. But uh, I think Dubnik's going to be the big thing, to your point. You know, he looked a lot better than last week. We've seen him kind of almost on a month-to-month basis really go up and down throughout his career here. So, you know, if he has an up month, that could be huge for them. And they could reel off, you know, something like 8 or 10 wins in in the month um, versus, you know, kind of being a little more up and down maybe more around the 500 mark if he's not as as sharp. So the Wild, even though they won two games this week, they are now three points out of a wild card spot. Yeah. The Pacific Division has the two wild card spots as we record here. Yeah, it's crazy. San Jose and, wait for it, the Edmonton Oilers. (laughs) Hitch hockey. They've won eight out of ten with Hitch. That's... It's... I mean, with that offense, with the, the offensive talent they have, it should it should have been it should have been a, a sort of a shocker to anybody that they were losing so many games early this year. Yeah, I just can't believe it. It's, <laughs> it's Ken Hitchcock, like, I'm sorry, but like, I've heard a lot of great things about Hitch, but I just feel like he's kind of a dinosaur at this Brett point. Brett Favre of the NHL. <laughs> he keeps coming back. Yeah, he's retiring. That's and then, actually you know what? very true. Yeah. <laughs> he he just he retires and then he comes back. That's he's done that what twice now in his career. Perfect. Just has to do it once more to be official Brett Favre level. Or did did Favre, Favre was only retire twice? He was only twice. Okay, well then there you go. Because he got traded to the Jets and then retired, so he can sign with. Yeah. Did the Oilers have to send uh, some team ambassadors up to find him to yeah. get him to come back out of they retirement? Had, they had to send a plane to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. <laughs> um, 
No, but could you imagine the Oilers if they had any goaltending at all? Like, <laughs> Cam Talbot is not that good. Um, and, and the other guy they got, I forget his name, but he's been better this season, but he's still kind of a unknown commodity, so... What if they could have gotten a different a different defenseman in the Larson uh, Hall trade? <laughs> or if they would the have kept Taylor Hall. The trade is one Hall. for one. Yeah, the trade is one for one. Good hockey trade. <laughs> yeah. The uh, hockey men really loved the hockey trade. Yeah. Yes. The best hockey trade ever? Benoit Pouliot for Guillaume Latendres in the middle of the 2010-11 season. That was a great, that was a great damn trade. <laughs> I, was, I mean, he, I had 22, he had 24 goals down like in... Like a thirty-some game stretch. Yeah, lots of it was. I loved Guillaume. Oh. That was a, such a weird phenomenon where then he just absolutely. I mean, injuries obviously played a huge part concussions. of it. Concussions. Yeah, like he, got, he got a concussion and he never he never no. recovered. Yeah. It was so his sad. His off-season conditioning too. I heard wasn't wasn't the yeah. best, but rivaled that of mine. <laughs> Quantities hey. of poutine. Hey, when yes. I was when I was really twelve. I mean, Tom might think I'm twelve now, but <laughs> when I was really twelve. That was the that, that was, was the that was, that was the player the of choice. Yeah. He was the player oh, of man. choice. That's that's frightening. When you were twelve, that was that was the Guillaume year. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I some reason I just remember I was at a spirit, I was at the first game after the trade, and that was a that was a pretty fun. When deal. I was twelve. That was the Western Finals run year. Yeah, somewhere yeah, I was a little Father older. Time's creeping up on me. Right, be thirty oh, soon. Wow, scary. Wow, hey, there's alcohol right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Any any other thoughts on the the wild era? It was not a not an overly newsy week. No, not really. But no, I, I think the call up of Luke Cunnan is interesting. Uh, it's something we haven't talked about, and he just uh, came on the wire here from uh, Mr. Russo. Uh, Luke Cunnan down. was resent to yeah. Iowa. Yep, no, that makes sense. With Koivu coming back, that makes sense. But it was good to get him a cameo. I think he had earned it. He played well enough in Iowa, and. Uh, you know, he wasn't uber productive in, in his uh, three games here. But I, I, it was good to see him up, and I, I think that he played fairly well. I don't think that he was, uh, you know, a liability out there at all, and, and yeah, I think he was almost as advertised. But, you know, he's still pretty young, and he's got a lot to learn. I do have a couple of other uh, kind of newsworthy things here from the last week. Uh, Charlie Coyle obviously uh, kind of heavily in the – the yeah. news for trade rumors, and he had a he had a pretty decent week. Yeah. Uh, the goal against I think it was was it Montreal, where he was on it was a or Montreal or Florida. It was a two on one, and then he just he just crossed over onto the backhand, and then he just yeah. roofs that was Florida. the backhand. That, that was, was Florida. Florida. Okay. Yeah. And it was just like, good lord, like where was this? Yeah. Where has this <laughs> right. been? Like. It just gives you the glimpse into his offensive ability. And if I'm Paul Fenton, like, I'm sending a video of that play to any potential <laughs> interested parties. And, like, here, watch this. This is what you can get. Like, try to sell for whatever you can. That's kind of where I'm at with him. That No, that's fair. I, it's just an interesting that, that that line is played so well. And, uh, I don't know, it just seems like he can't put it together and and even you know now he's obviously had a pretty good week with that line but um it'll be very interesting to see if, you know the, the success that line had if he is moved because that line has clicked so well i did find it funny when coil said i've been traded to montreal five years in a row <laughs> that is pretty awesome <laughs> so clearly he is not uh not immune to what's uh, being said about him mm-hmm the other newsworthy thing of the week was, uh, as pretty much as expected, uh, Brent Flair leaves the Minnesota Wild organization for uh, the Philadelphia Flyers as he takes the uh, assistant general manager position to Chuck Fletcher, uh, who uh, apparently cannot make up his mind if he wants to fire Dave Haxtell here on Sunday. As uh, Dave Haxtell, as a mid-afternoon, was ref- was fired and they were going to hire Joel Quenville Mm -hmm. but then an hour later somebody had reached out to Joel Quenville and he said that that report was false so that doesn't necessarily mean anything because it could still happen tomorrow but uh, yeah the whole flair thing good for him I I don't think that he was obviously Paul Fenton didn't think much of him uh, by you know demoting him to the to the basement or whatever he did this summer and 
I don't know. I, I kind of want some kind of uh, scapegoat for the Philippe Johansson pick. <laughs> and and if, if said scapegoat is Brent Flair, I know ultimately it was Paul Fenton's call, but if if that was uh, Brent Flair that, that very seriously lobbied for the Philippe Johansson pick. I still pick. don't get why you just kind of let the lame duck assistant GM run that, the draft Me table. neither. I mean, other than you know the amount of preparation they'd already put into the draft, I understand that. But it's so weird to me because it's like Paul Fenton was a you know the AGM in, in Nashville. It's like what you weren't preparing for the draft, like and and that pick of all things, you know what I mean? Like that's the confusing part to me too. Just like you, if you want to use the existing information they have for rounds two through seven, be my guest. Those are the unknown players. Those are the guys that there's not a lot of stuff on. You trust your scouts on those guys. The first round, there is so much information on those. I scouted the first round. Like, you know, I'm not qualified for anything. I'm barely qualified for this podcast, let alone, you know, drafting for an NHL team. Nobody nobody reads draft analysis. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that joke never gets old. Um, but even I knew that was a terrible pick, and I knew they could have gone in so many different directions. And, and so, yeah, anyway, it, it just it, it is confusing, but... I mean, whatever. Best switches to Brent Flair or whatever. And Fletcher's staff had had a decent time in get finding some of some gems, I guess, in sure. the two through sevens, sure. right? Like yeah, Eric Holla was a seventh round pick. And, and this year's draft, I like him. <laughs> and this year's draft, I thought was very good after the first pick. Mm-hmm. I mean, rounds three through seven, I, I thought they did a phenomenal job this year. Yeah, they, uh, it was just that first round pick that had made everyone's brains explode. You know, so yeah, this is what it is. It made. It made my brain explode so much I couldn't even make it to the draft party. <laughs> That's right. All right, on to the Bruce Boudreaux quote of the week. Hi, this is Bruce Boudreaux. I don't see how in Toronto that they're calling it, unless it's a guy they just pulled in off the street that hasn't seen hockey before. If I were the fans, I'd be, I'd be booing even more because that... You know, they pay good money for this. If you want it, don't just think you want it. Go out and f***ing want it. Your Bruce Boudreau quote of the week comes from Thursday night's game between uh, the Wild and Florida Panthers. Uh, late in the game, Jordan Greenway took a Jewel Erickson X stick to the face uh, where he was uh, bleeding uh, pretty bad. Got himself a nice zipper. Exactly. Had some, uh, had some stitches done and... Uh, Bruce Boudreaux was uh, commenting on Jordan Greenway when he said, well, he's a hockey player. Now he looks like one. <laughs> that's oh. a pretty good, that's pretty decent quote. Yeah. That was that was the best quote we had for this week. So, Yeah, yeah. I feel like with the swoon, Bruce didn't have much. Uh, you know, like he said, he kind of clams up when things aren't going well. It's so maybe no, now that uh, things have turned around a little bit, we'll get some better quotes out of him. It's no hotel, uh, the it's there's no smoke in my room. I'm not getting out of the hotel. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a great one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that uh, that's your Bruce Boudreaux uh, quote of the week. Now we fire over to our Kirill watch. Kaprasov across for Gusev. Kaprasov shoots. He scores. He scores. Kirill Kaprizov has, I don't think he's played in a game this last week. Or he did play in one. So th- he was at 31 last week. He was? I really should write this down. Yeah, we should probably keep track of that a little better. But anyway, on the season. Oh, no, they had a tournament. Yeah, there was some kind of a yeah, tournament Yeah, he played in a on. tournament. Four games, three points in that tournament. Um, so yeah, that's pretty awesome. I tweeted a goal from the Twitter account. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, no, I was looking at a CSK in Moscow, and I was like, yeah, it doesn't look like he scored anything, but... Um, I don't think he played. Yeah, no, it, so, yeah, there was a tournament, EHT tournament. I'm not familiar with that is, even. I don't either. I, <laughs> I'm i not uh, the Russian hockey expert. Yeah, I was going to say, Russia, man, it just... So, yeah, that, that's, I mean, you know, t- obviously top competition there in, in, a, in an international tournament. Um, sans your Americans and Canadians, I'm sure. Right. I think it was some European tournament, obviously, so... Um, but that's always good, even when you can produce and stuff like that. That's always great. So, good to see. Ben, did you have a other uh, prospect you wanted to highlight this sure. week? Sure. Um, so, kind of going down the list a little bit, and 
we uh, we had a fun little celebration for uh, Philip Johansson finally scoring a point. Um, but uh, I'll focus very briefly on another right-handed Swedish Johansson that was picked this year by the Minnesota Wild, Simon, uh, who is actually Simon says. yeah, who is actually not not doing too bad. Um, you know, he's played in uh, in one of the lower leagues in Sweden. 29 games, 10 points. You know, he's 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 a defenseman, so obviously not going to crank out a ton of points, but he's got a heavy shot, so uh, three goals, seven assists, but also played in uh, one of the international junior tournaments they got going on right now, uh, 11 games, six points. So that's that's a go. pretty decent output for, for a defenseman. Um, he's a guy that, you know, would be interesting to keep an eye on. Right shot defenseman, which is always, like, gold as far as the NHL is concerned. Um, so it's it'll be interesting to keep an eye on him seeing as how he, he might have more offensive talent than the guy they took in the first round. Drew, since we have you here and you uh, follow the Gophers a little more closely, how is uh, wild drafty Jack Sadek doing? Um, Sadek so far, well, um, there was a few games where there was a little bit of defensive lapse in terms of just generally the defense as a whole not really looking like they were, uh, I mean, they weren't getting all the... Get, getting the job done correctly. I mean, they were there was a lot of offensive chance against them. Uh, granted, the teams they played the last few weeks, Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan, two teams that made it to the Frozen Four last year. Yeah. Um, but generally, um, it, he's one of the leaders of that team. He's one of the leaders of the defense in general because he's the, I believe he's the only senior uh, by class on the on on the roster right uh, on the defensive side of the roster right now sure. especially with a lot of youth there so he's he's responsible for the top line minutes playing against the top lines of just about every other team and uh um it's he's i think he's making strides but uh yeah there's definitely some i change over in terms of the way uh mike gensel handled the defense and now uh garrett boyne's hand, handling the defense uh, bob's new assistant so and uh, just in general, how are the the Gophers doing? As uh, I am uh, a Gophers homer, if you will, <laughs> so I'm always uh, curious to see how they're uh, they're doing. Um, they had a stretch of games where it felt like they lost a ton, and then uh, I think Bob Motzko pointed it out, but they realized that they only lost one of their last seven games up until uh, the break, and uh, um, even though a few of those were those weird. Uh, ties that would take half a whole podcast to explain um <laughs> ties that resulted in overtime losses or double overtime losses so an extra point to the big 10 in the other teams and that happened three straight games of two two ties um two two against ohio state and one against michigan but um yeah it's a it was it, they they went into the break on a high note because they they were able to beat a michigan team that was ranked number 15 um and they got tied against them the first night, won, again, won uh, the second night, and they had uh, a more respectable amount of goal scoring than they have in the past because uh, this season's been, uh, I mean, the absolute absence of consistency in terms of scoring because it's either been 0-1 goals and then sometimes they'll spike and hit seven. They've hit seven oh. twice this year. And then I like those games. It's it's <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's fun it's fun to watch. But then you then you get to the games where they can't figure it out offensively, and they have enough talent and enough veteran guys who have scored a ton of goals in the past. Like Tyler Sheehy had 53 points in what tw- in 32, 33 games one season. Yeah. Um, they have they have a lot of veteran guys who uh, are they're certainly going to miss next year, but they they need to be really be consistently scoring now and uh tyler she he had a pretty good last four or five games before the break to uh to uh get get loaded and then they come back on the week after christmas so they come back on the 28th against a pretty bad fair state team All fair right. state good but Lord. that's the last uh quote unquote maybe gimme they have it's not a sure. gimme with the gophers this year with right. any team but it's the last team that they play that isn't routinely ranked because right. the sure. big Ten is not a gimme anymore it's <sighs> yeah, it's not. really not. And, and, uh, it, that's that's good though. Like, it's good to see. Like, you knew like the first year when the Gophers just kind of stomped all over the Big Ten. Like, yeah, like that was expected. But the first six years, yeah, or the first what five? Four, they won the four, five, 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 years, won the five right. championships in a row. But like, you could see like if if you could see because in the old days, players who didn't get recruited by the Gophers, they wanted to stay in the conference so they could play against the Gophers. It became a thing. Right. So. 
now that when the Gophers went to the Big Ten, it's like the Big Ten's going to get better eventually because those good players that the Gophers don't recruit, they're going to want to play against the Gophers and mm-hmm. stick it to the Gophers. So it was only a matter of time before the Big Ten got better, which is good, but nobody really pays attention. Everybody still whines about it. But yeah. hey. I just want to get to a bet, and I think I think once Gopher, I think Motsko is obviously the, the right guy for that. I'd like to see them get back to being appointment television in the Twin Cities because – in in the last few years, the last probably decade of the WCHA, it definitely was. I mean, it was, yeah, it was. Friday and Saturday night. You had the Gopher game on, and you know there was no two ways about it. Mm-hmm. And now I, I think even with the Big Ten being as good as the, as it is, um, it's still just not. Uh, that's not the case. And so it, it'd be interesting to see if it gets to that point, even with uh, what. <laughs> I'm a big fan of that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you know. <laughs> So okay, <laughs> Do you want to address yeah, that? Yeah, we're we're gonna address this. So <laughs> there's some there's been some back and forth between us on our podcast Twitter, Drew and our boss Tom Schreier, um, and uh, uh, we have a Mr. John Candles has uh, chimed if, into the conversation. Yeah, yeah, if you listen to that, go for hockey podcast. Uh, yeah. Captain Candles is their questions MVP. Yes. Um, I, I believe he's that. his own coverage uh, native as well, to where he he, <laughs> he, he scours the, the network for for their podcast. So John is replying to a tweet from uh, Drew that says Tom back at it with the "Leave us outside the studio to freeze to death" trick. That that actually is a quote from uh, it's a Nate Wells quote, and uh, <laughs> it happened earlier in the year, and uh, I, I I think I laughed for about five straight minutes in the studio before we uh, our production meeting, but I had to I had to re up it with this uh, newfound situation today. Yeah. So uh, John replies to that tweet and he says, Does Don- Tom even care about Drew? He's never on the pod anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that got a laugh out of both of uh, me. You can say Drew the same thing about uh, our yeah, pod. He's just, uh, he's just calling, yeah, he's just calling out Tom. Tom's Tom's a busy guy, apparently. He doesn't yeah, have time yeah. for hockey podcasts anymore. He's, no. He's too busy covering the Wolves. Yeah, he's too busy in his. Uh, over in the North Loop or over uh, downtown <laughs> watching the Wolves. Yeah. So anyway, where where the hell were we? We were on uh, Big Ten WCHA. Yeah. No, somewhere. I was just just to wrap it up. It'll be it'll be interesting to see if, if that becomes a thing. You know, now with the Big yeah. Ten being as good as it is, mm-hmm. and uh, I think people will turn will will turn around and start watching it because um, even now it's 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 a good product and, every, and most of the games are just extraordinarily fun to watch in terms no matter what teams are playing because yeah. it, when the parody's there like that that was some of the problem probably the first few years. Um, Given that some teams, the the big teams, would beat up on the little teams, even last year, you might see that just based on the standings. Notre Dame was um, just a force last year. They they beat every Big Ten. They made every Big Ten team look a lot worse. And this season, if you look at the Big Ten standings through the first half, all their records look pretty pretty like in the muck. Yeah. And that and there's like there's a whole bunch of teams still ranked, but all the team all, all the teams are good and beating up on each other. And that's just yeah. a few teams on the up, um, a few teams that are still in that upper echelon of being really good and i think people will start tuning in again because it'll it, they'll these r- r- new rivalries will develop and like ch- conferences have changed over time anyways and once you get into a certain point you're going to have rivalries like no matter who it's against i think in, in much like big 10 football because there's a lot of there's a lot of clout behind big 10 football obviously mm-hmm. it created big 10 hockey pretty much uh i think to spice up things <laughs> a little bit <laughs> thanks <big> barry <laughs> I think to spice up things a little bit in Big Ten hockey, they need traveling trophies. Let's let's bring back traveling trophies to hockey. We can play Michigan for the Little Brown uh, Nut Cup or something. We can play <laughs> we can play uh, Wisconsin for uh, what was that? what was his name? I'm forgetting right now. We can now. play Wisconsin for Barry Alvarez's head. <laughs> 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 for Barry Alvarez to get axed. There we go. There go. That's hey. that's a good one. Hey. Uh, so yeah, we we, we got to get some traveling trophies into yeah. uh, into Big Ten hockey. I think that would spice things up. I also forgot about this during the during our Philadelphia Flyers talk, but also you know Chuck Fletcher maybe spent so much time in Minnesota that he wasn't able to he wasn't able to tolerate Dave Haxtell anymore. Good. <laughs> good. I don't know if he if he turned into a Minnesota fan and you know what he I mean, saw he the might not have a lot of love good. for Dave Haxtell. He saw the goonery that went down in Fargo and was just like, you know what, I can't be associated with this. This <laughs> good. is this is just too awful. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It is interesting. I think you posed the question if Hacksaw is going to go back to college or not. Um, that's interesting to see if he ends winds up somewhere at a – because yeah. certainly any big hockey program with an opening this, this summer mm-hmm. has got to at least, you know, consider it. Yeah. And it, it's interesting to see what he wants to do if he wants to stay in the NHL, yeah. which I don't know if there's a head coaching job in the NHL for him, but I think he could definitely could go back to college. And, I and have a tough time thinking he'll – be back in the NHL? No, I. Uh, yeah, I mean he's. Uh, you know, it was pretty short shelf life on him in Philly. So, all right, that uh, that'll do it for our prospect uh, segment. Very quickly, we move over to the Central Intelligence Report. Central Intelligence. Yeah, I've been scoreboard watching since opening night. So, I don't know <laughs> if that counts or anything, but uh, think. Hockey players are hockey players, and they want to see where they are, and they, they know how close the everything is. They know that every game is vital. Central Intelligence, uh, just checking in on the Central Division, seeing how everyone's doing. As I mentioned before, the Central Division no longer holding any of the wild card spots in the Western Conference. The Pacific Division just uh, going beast mode as uh, Anaheim, 8 out of 10. Vegas, 7 out of 10. San Jose has won three in a row, and the Edmonton Oilers have won eight out of ten. It's got to be the first time since realignment. Holy yeah, moly. <laughs> it really is. This is, this is. I saw a tweet the other nuts. day from one, I forget, some national NHL pundit who was like, the Pacific could take both wild card spots, which has been the complete opposite, you know, like you said, since realignment. Uh, that, it would be, I mean, it's, it's a real possibility, in it, but, man, that's uh, kind of jarring for, for us Central Division types that uh, have been following, following the Western Conference for the last couple of seasons. So checking in on the Central Division, uh, Nashville still in the lead in the division with 45 points. Uh, they've won three in a row. Uh, they are very closely followed by the Winnipeg Jets of 44 points. The Jets have won eight of their last ten. They're just playing very good hockey right now. They've seemingly recaught their magic from last season as uh, they're, they're playing very lights-out hockey right now. Colorado... 42 points. Uh, they're still that that just great one-line dynamic team uh, that just keeps on rolling. Then the Wild at 36 points. Uh, they, well, we've talked about how they've been in recent mm-hmm. times, and you have the Dallas Stars who've lost four in a row. Uh, they're at 35 points. And then you uh, go down the list, you have the, the St. Louis Blues at uh, 28 points. And then the Chicago Blackhawks at 26 points. And we did get a Twitter question from our friend uh, Joe Bully, uh, who wanted to know what uh, is actually happening with Vladimir Tarasenko. So I'll answer that here in the Central Division segment. But <laughs> I was thinking about this on the way here. Like, just something something stinks in that St. Louis Blues locker room. Like, <laughs> it's Jake Allen. He's ass. That <laughs> <laughs> He literally smells like he ass. He literally sees ass and he smells like uh, ass. Something is just, that should be a very good team. I, I don't understand. And yeah. they're so bad. Something in that room just is not good. It's rotten. And I'm going to float out a hot take into the universe. But if you follow the uh, career trajectory of uh, Ryan O'Reilly... He comes from Colorado, huh. bad. Yeah. Goes to Buffalo, bad. <laughs> and now he's on St. Louis, who weirdly just turned bad. Yeah. Like, and, and this is a guy who has openly spoken on record about if he wants to play hockey. Like, there's no joy in playing hockey. Like, huh? Yeah, it's an interesting thought. That's just something i think about when i when i when my thought process goes okay something's wrong with in the blues room and you see guys like tarasenko who is a superstar in the national hockey league yeah. just not scoring anymore and the blues are just a complete tire fire something stinks in the room and you just can't help but think like is this is this like a ryan o'reilly thing because wherever he goes Losing follows, and and, and, and and that thing in Buffalo where he just openly ponders, like you know, don't want to try to play hockey, right? Yeah. That's, I think that's, that's kind of where my yeah, head. and look how good all of a sudden Buffalo is, <laughs> yeah, right? And Buffalo's amazing, now. yeah. And they were they should have been good for so many that years. That game against yeah. Toronto this last week that was great, hockey. yeah. I, I, I not not to discredit your theory at all. I think that's very interesting theory, and and certainly when you have you know for lack of a better term when you have a locker room cancer like that, 
I think that's underrated as to what that can do to a locker room. And I think that when a lot of people look at why teams are the way they are and what makes them tick, for some reason human psychology isn't factored in a whole lot, and I don't understand that. I never have. Um, so I think you're onto something there. That being said, we already did mention Jake Allen being ass, and that kind of seems like problem A number one for the Blues this year is goaltending. So, uh, you know, it, you know they just got rid of uh, Chad Johnson, their backup, for reasons that nobody was really quite sure why they bothered getting rid of their backup goalie when their starter is playing terribly. Was peak peak hockey Twitter this week when Chad Ochocinco quote tweeted yes. Friedman's tweet <laughs> of Chad Johnson's on waivers when yeah. he just had the sad emoji. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, my God, somebody's paying attention to hockey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that goaltending is is the bulk of the problem in St. Louis. Um, but there's certainly probably a cultural thing, and, and Mike Yo getting fired maybe was uh, you know uh, kind of similar to when he got fired here, where it seemed like it was kind of a cultural thing where he was letting the the inmates run the asylum. Did you see the fight on practice the other day? Yeah, yeah. Blues? Bertuzzo yeah, and uh, someone else. Sanford. San- and Sanford yeah, yeah, yeah. got yeah. reassigned the other yeah. day. So. Wow. I don't know. Something just stinks there, and that's that's kind of what I wondered. But all right, that's enough of uh, central intelligence slash uh, hot takes. So, <laughs> last but certainly not least, we move on to the segment you've all been waiting for: jerseys. Here's the start of the third period. What team is this? It's not Team USA. Well, yes, it is. They've got on new uniforms. They're wearing the logo of the duck. I've never seen this before. We're going to spend a few minutes with Drew talking about jerseys, much to the chagrin of Tom Schreier. I love how this episode is the roast of Tom Schreier, and he's not here. <laughs> he almost was. That's the best, that's the best time to roast Tom when he's not here. <laughs> he almost, he Don't worry, been. he didn't listen more than five minutes into the podcast. That's Don't true. Worry. Yeah. Uh, but, so we're... We're going to talk jerseys with Drew because Drew has a lot of great jersey takes. And sure. we, we've been trying to get him on here for so long, mm-hmm. and now he's here. So we're going to we're gonna first we're going to lead into our kind of regular jersey segment. We're going to talk about the 2010 jerseys, and then we're going to get to kind of some other questions yeah. for you since you're a guest. Cool. Sure. All right. But... The 2010 decade. Now, actually, Ben, is there, before we dive to the 2010s, was there just one jersey that really just was in your craw all week from the 2000s that you didn't get to last week that you really want to get to? <laughs> the floor is open for you. There was several, and, and we were limited in our time on the jersey segment last week, and I was not happy about it. Um, but, no, there were several. I, I don't uh, I don't even recall which ones we actually mentioned on air. I don't either. But there was, I mean, basically, you know, we we touched on this briefly, but Re- Reebok took over in 2007, and it was a complete gong show, uh, and and it was kind of the dark era for for NHL jerseys. I feel like um, basically every jersey was required to have ugly piping on it, and uh, there was just a lot of goofy stuff going on with the shoulder yokes, and especially with the side striping. Uh, it was just, it was just so bad. We didn't talk about how. I think people forget this because they switched back. But the New York Islanders was pretty ugly in the 2000s when the Reebok took in. Yeah. Yeah, that first year Reebok, yeah. Yeah. They, that was again, bad. they went to the navy. They yeah. went they, let's let's darken the color or dull <laughs> dull the brightness of it and that always ends badly. Right. Yeah, so I don't know, there was a lot that, that was bad in in the after the turn of the century. It was just there's so much stuff that was just ill-advised uh you know, lots, lots. I said lots and lots of piping. Um, you know, but you know, we talked about the Buffa Slug. We talked about, um, you know, what else? We talked about. There was a couple other ones that we talked about, but a few that we didn't mention. The Sens jersey that one was really bad. Oh, uh, it's just still said bad. Sens. They, they had a chance to get rid of that. <laughs> and then also, what was also bad? The Thrashers. Oh. Before they finally moved, like that was just a bad look. Rest in peace, Thrashers. Yeah, rest in peace, the Atlanta Thrashers. But once they, Reebok really took got, over, it was really bad. But they I think their, their white jersey up until Reebok looked pretty decent. It wasn't bad. Yeah, I it wasn't it. bad. 
But uh, yeah, it was at least symmetrical. Yeah, yeah. The blue <laughs> that was one, the one thing that was good about the it. The blue one was. I just, I just don't understand an asymmetrical hockey jersey. Yeah. Asymmetrical logo is obviously. Remember fine. the Oilers had ridiculous piping. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just looking Again, at it now, it's let's just all the colors. <laughs> make it darker. Yeah. Just bad, bad idea. Okay. So there's plenty of it. Twenty there's plenty there to be there, upset yeah. about. Yeah. So it, okay to the 2010s. Now. My general research of this decade has kind of given me the impression that this isn't there's there's a couple of things that stand out. One, a lot of teams really emphasized going back to old classics that worked. Yes. And then there's just a lot of egregious jerseys out there still from this decade. Yes. To this day. So there's either like really good throwbacks or there's just really bad like really bad jerseys and there's not a lot of in between (laughs) and so i'm gonna lead with the worst jersey of the decade and what's funny is drew actually mentioned this very jersey before the podcast as we're talking about all right uh jerseys we were trying to decide on wearing to this uh show and we're going to go dig into the archives from the 2013-2014 uh, Buffalo Sabres. <laughs> Indeed. With the uh, the yellow front and uh, the main navy blue on the back and with gray trim on uh, the sleeves. That is an abysmal jersey. And that will stand the test of time as being an awful jersey. And we called it from that very day it was revealed by, I think it was Steve Ott was the model. Which is just setting yourself up for so much failure, yeah. yeah. The model was very befitting of the jersey. (laughs) So I open the floor to what your worst jersey of the decade is. Okay, upon doing research, I believe this comes down to a lot because... In the decade starts off generally as I mean it gets better progressively every year you go towards the present. The two thousand ten, two thousand eleven was pretty like there are more bad ones than there are good ones, I think, that year. Because which is, which is weird because you think like you're moving towards Adidas, you didn't think that would be good, but yeah. it's actually good. But like the Ducks one was pretty unimpressive, the Thrashers was still asymmetrical and just blocky and stripy, uh uh Boston was pretty clean. Uh, Buffalo still didn't know what their colors wanted to be. Um, the Colorado Avalanche had the piping. Um, they were the worst. It was pretty bad. They yeah. were the worst. They were the the stars figured it was just good to go Dallas across the chest on both jerseys. That was <laughs> yeah. the football jersey. I, yeah. I don't understand that. The that. 2000s. Right. That was a 2000s yeah. jersey. Yeah. One good thing, the Oilers brought back the classic blues that yes. I think that year. Um, but generally, I think the worst ones still were the, the Nashville Predators, but also... The Florida Panthers blue alternate, the two-tone blue. <laughs> yeah, the baby I, blue. I didn't. I'm not a fan of that oh, one. But yeah, that about one that. thing that it, that has pretty much stood the test of time, and most of the template is still there today, is the Ottawa Senators re- rebrand from Reebok that stood all the Super way through Nintendo. the decade. Super Nintendo. Yeah. It, no, it, 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 it found its way through the decade, and it made it to Adidas. It didn't even get changed. And, and it was that. funny because they were one of the teams that was rumored to re- be redoing their jerseys. Yeah under Adidas and then they debut their jerseys and they're almost nearly identical and it's like what happened like no team and and granted Eugene Melnick exactly yeah that's that's what happened is Eugene Melnick but no team needed a redesign more than the Ottawa Senators and it just didn't happen yeah Um, so one one jersey that I had that I had totally forgotten about until I just looked is egregious for a lot of reasons it doesn't look good and it's very sacrilegious uh in 2011 the New (laughs) York Islanders introduced a black jersey and, you know, it was basically like a, hey, hey, we're moving to Brooklyn. I it mean, was a it was, fan design. It was before, yeah, it was yeah. before Brooklyn. But, you know, and then worse that yet. That is awful. Yeah, so that, that's a terrible looking jersey. And then when they did move to Brooklyn, they came out with a muted black, white, and gray jersey as well. And it's just like this whole move to Brooklyn has been an absolute failure, an absolute disaster. And they're celebrating it with a jersey that has none of their colors on it whatsoever. Yep. Classic colors that, you know, have... have for the most part, you know, they survive the Gordon's Fishermen, so they can survive anything, yeah. basically. <laughs> and uh, it, so that's definitely up there for the worst. The Islanders just need to stick with the classics. If you want to bring back the Gordon's Fishermen for a laugh, I'm fine with that. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but just stick with your classic jerseys for the most part. I also think one of my I think my two worst absolutely rather than just kind of trends I was sort of dancing around the question the first time but the redesign of the Carolina Hurricanes home from the old school the one they won the cup in that they just added the yoke to yeah they redesigned it to look like the Soviet jerseys from the 80s <laughs> to where it was just solid, the home jersey was solid red and two two lines down the side they took away the black. They took away the hurricane flag yeah, striping. Yeah, 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 yeah. It went to very plain. Yep. That, and, and they took the black out, basically. I, yeah. I couldn't stand that one. I, and I just, like, I thought the design looked good. They had a lot of cool things going on with that. But also, generally, the All-Star, jer- the All-Star game oh, jerseys of the, of the Awful. 2000s. Every, I, I feel like people Awful. are kind of, they're like, oh, these are cool because they're, like, edgy. But no. the, the neon green and black, that's dumb. Yeah. The Those blue and Columbus, red ones that, that was, John like, the Scott stall All-Star years. All-Star jersey dumb, was awful. Dumb. Yuck. No thanks. Yeah, pretty I'd, brutal. I'd rather have an Ottawa Senators now, jersey. <laughs> let us not forget that the Nashville Predators, when Reebok Edge kicked in, had the most egregious piping, and it was yes. yellow. Yes. And we had to watch it through an entire playoff run <laughs> to the Stanley Cup final, and then they switched. They had the opportunity to switch, and they did it. They still went with yellow. They got rid of the piping, but it just doesn't work. I'm sorry. They need to go back to blue, and yellow for the Nashville Predators, is it's bad. And they need to be pointed out as one of the worst <laughs> of the decade. I, You know, I, I was talking with Drew about this beforehand. Uh, I made a concept of their jersey being navy, where basically I just took paint, Microsoft paint, and I filled mm-hmm. their white jersey with navy, and it looked pretty good. Um you know, it was pretty simple. Their design right now, to their credit, is pretty simple. And I do like the design. They they went heavy on the yellow. Mm. If they use yellow for their home jerseys, I'm fine with that. If the NHL uh, if the NHL adopts kind of what the NBA is doing and lets teams kind of flop around a bit, which they have been this season. We've yeah. seen some the color on color. Have done that a lot. The Hurricanes are basically refusing to wear their white jerseys yeah. anymore, which is fine. Um, All the power to him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The red one's better than yeah, the red exactly. Tom Dundon. Yeah, exactly. Apparently he doesn't like the white jerseys. But, All right. Um, so, yeah, I, I would like to see that where they could use that navy jersey and then use that yellow whenever they want, i.e. at home. Yeah. Um, I also i am going to put one last one we're going to throw into the discussion before we go to the best. Mm-hmm. The Edmonton Oilers orange oh, because God. they wear was, it all the time now why? i was just about yeah. to say that i was about to sort of pose a question what's the worst of the new adidas era in the last two years and i think it's that orange one that became the home because they changed the again question. they darken the blue they yeah. darken the orange and it yeah. just looks kind of it doesn't it's not bright it's not poppy it's it i don't know i don't know i, it, I just it like is, the bright it is kind of highlighterish on the orange part yeah. i mean orange isn't but it just i don't know why it's you a, ever get away from the gretzky mm-hmm. colors yeah. Like, Don't why would you, you know, they, they made the mistake of doing that in the 90s like everyone else did. Like you mm-hmm. said, they went darker, they went navy, yeah. and they went copper, whatever. It, you know, it could have looked worse, but fine. Yeah. Then you make the positive switch. You go back to the royal blue. You go back to the classic orange. Mm-hmm. Why are you messing with that? Yeah. They You've got the Connor day. McDavid. Yeah, exactly. They, they brought it back as a third jersey because mm-hmm. they recognize how good it looks. Yeah. And you've got Connor McDavid. God forbid you try to market something in a jersey that looks good. Yeah. But I mean, the the Pittsburgh Penguins did it the best. They they went, they, they did, did the exact same thing, and they brought back. You know what? Yep. They brought back the bright gold, and that's yeah, yeah. that's kind of like it, it 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 doesn't necessarily hurt your eyes, but it like stands out. Sure. Yeah. And it makes the Penguins the Penguins. So yeah, like yeah. It, it pops. You just gotta let it be. It's like you're gonna sell jerseys because they're like they're out there. It's like yeah. why do you think the Charlotte Hornets sold so many? Jer- why do you think the mighty the Mighty Ducks jerseys sold so well? Yeah. It's because they wow. have crazy colors and they look great. The Mighty Ducks sell so many jerseys because I just keep buying them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Yeah. Pretty much. No. The joke on the podcast was a few years ago was the Pittsburgh Penguins threw their Vegas gold in the dumpster and then the Philadelphia <laughs> Flyers picked it up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they I mean, did the outline, yeah. I I'll I'll be Hard pressed to see the Vegas Golden Knights change, maybe change their their color scheme a little bit to be to include more red or include more more of the poppy colors that they're looking for. Because yeah. especially in that market, you need to be flashy. Yeah. <laughs> and Ooh. who knows? They they I wouldn't be shocked to see them change their color scheme or at least a part of it in the coming years. I'm also going to highlight Florida HC. Yes. Their rebrand was not good. No. And, and that, yeah, was when you were saying Florida Panthers, I kept, I think, kept thinking in my head you mean Florida right. HC because that was the most soccery of soccer I, uh, I had redesigns. This, I had this discussion with my roommate at the Panthers game, at the Panthers and Wild game the other day. He said, what are your thoughts on the the, the new jerseys they have? And I'm Because I, I have one of the 
I have a red one of the old the sure. run right Classic before that style, re- yeah. rebrand and and I I was said it just looks too soccer to me and yeah. I mean maybe maybe that works for getting a fan base who that is necessarily not as accustomed to hockey now now let's let's remove the phrase <laughs> getting too soccery <laughs> as a derogatory term for a hockey jersey i think right. it's not necessarily yeah. the best the route the Florida panthers isn't a good look but we're going to we're going to put it in it's getting too soccery well then you're you're have you seen those over 90, the bat. have you seen those 98 pinstripe soccer gophers jerseys yes we're we're coming to that i have that right. noted here okay uh, okay very quickly the best of the 2010 decade what is the best jersey that has been released in 2010 the 2010s? Uh, you know we, we didn't get to it uh, the la kings redesign that they did right before 2010 was good they introduced the black jerseys then they made a matching white jersey yeah, I think for for a team that's had a lot of really great jerseys in the past, I think this is a pretty good look on them right now. And so that was a redesign that I really liked. Also, one more briefly, I was homerish last week. I'll do it again. I think the wild white jersey that was introduced, uh, I believe it's 2011 good. or 12. Very good jersey. Yep. 13. 13, was it? Okay. Very good jersey. I really enjoy the wild whites. I think they've they've stood up. They've been pretty good. I don't think they need to mess with them anytime soon. But I think that was a very it was a nice improvement over they were using their original whites up until that time. So, yeah, I think my best is they're two two tone jerseys. Even though on one there's sort of is a tertiary color that doesn't really show up, but the Maple Leafs rebrand, very good. Mm-hmm. It's a clean. I love two tone jerseys because oh. it's blue and white. It's all you need. It's yep. simple. Yep. It's, it gets the it gets the point across. And then. Same color scheme, but the lightning. Yes, uh, yes. The lightning rebrand. It's simpler. Tremendous. It's less like patches of like here's a patch of blue, here's a patch of black, and here's a couple stripes. And <laughs> I guess that was an Iserman thing. Bay. I guess Iserman was very passionate yeah. about making that team more. Uh, it looks know, traditional. It looks. It looks like the Red Wings. Look, yeah, look more it like the Red Wings. Like the we talk about the 2000s. They were very much a Reebok Edge team. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was bad. Although but they they hit a home run with their. Home and road jerseys, but then their third jerseys the since their rebrand the have been not good. <laughs> yeah, which makes no well, sense. Well, and then the the rumored one that we haven't officially seen yet, that is like that weird. Uh, it's like a stealthy type. It just it looks awful. They should bring back the storm jersey. That would look great in the in the in the, uh, in the added zero era. Oh, uh, the big white collar on it. Uh, yeah, no. no we don't, <laughs> big, we don't yeah, need that. Big old white collar. Yeah. And the dark storm clouds. Uh, all right. I have a Take feeling a you're of, not going to enjoy this part. Take a lot of courage for me to say yeah. this. So this is a very good jersey that was introduced in this decade. Uh-huh. And do you want to say reintroduced because it's close? Yeah, enough. it's a play on a on a seventies jersey. Sure. I can't see it, so <laughs> he can. Uh huh. The, I think it was in, what was it, like 2013? No. It was in 2015. The Colorado Avalanche introduced their Colorado Rockies like theme jersey. Yep. And it's very good. So it was a play off their Winter Classic jersey the year before. Yep. It's a very good, good jersey. And I. <laughs> and honestly, the Winter Classic one looks really good too. Yeah. That stadium series one wasn't too <coughs> yeah, bad that's itself, what it was. but yeah. it it's a very good jersey, and they've rightfully kept it with the yes. Adidas switch. And and for them with the Adidas switch because they were so bad with Reebok. I'm wearing the classic 1997 through 99 uh, Patrick Y Avalanche jersey right gone now. Gone back to it. Yeah, and then so the, they were one of the big winners when Adidas took over because they went back to this design. They went back to having mountains on the bottom of the jersey kind of look. They got rid of all semblance of piping whatsoever, which was a godsend. They were one of the big winners, you know. We and we called it out as such at the time. Where it's like, man, they look so much better with just just the little changes that they did when Adidas took over. Yep. So that's that's my big uh, <laughs> big winner of the the twenty tens. And shout out to the Washington Capitals for reintroducing their throwbacks. They haven't made that yes. permanent, but. Yeah, if, if we don't, yeah, I mean, obviously we like the Kachina Coyote as well. We like that the Flames brought back. You know, all the original jerseys coming back, that's great. Uh, we didn't really cover that, but I think that trend on the whole 
is is great because uh, there's a lot of really good jerseys that are seeing the light of day again. Shout out to the Anaheim Ducks for just going through all their jerseys ever this year. <laughs> yes, true. And just if we could just get them, have a you know, we I know you and I disagree on this, but their current third jersey, you you enjoy because of the logo. I don't because of the amount of colors on it. Um, but I'd like to see them go with something a little simpler next season when it's not an anniversary Sounds jersey. Like they are. Yeah, and to just to feature that Mighty Duck logo again but to use just a little bit more of a simple color palette rather than cramming every single franchise color into one jersey like they're yeah. doing this year. Let's see. The Ducks right it. They're wrong. So I am <laughs> I'm fine with them now. Yeah, but they still, I mean, yeah. You're not wrong. I mean, they did, they did right the wrong. Join me on the path to enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> we do like John Gibson, but it is those jerseys, that the, the primaries right now, just, ugh. All right. So Drew is here, and I have a few questions for him on jerseys. All right. Uh, so the first of which is, since you are on the Gopher Hockey Podcast on Zone Coverage, I have to ask your favorite Gopher. I want your best, and I want your worst Gopher Hockey jersey from all time. Ooh. I think my favorite of all time, maybe it's part of the... The legacy that lives with them, but I like the uh, I like the ones that they won the nat- Natty Champs in in uh, 2002. Mm-hmm. Those okay. white ones, I like white base jerseys just because they kind of they bring a lot of balance, especially when like the colors dark on I guess the, sure. the yoke or whatever. But it had that cool look. I think it was like a flyer, the old flyers template. Mm-hmm. But I liked that the name the nameplate was on the yoke, so it was like a di- it was like the same color as the base of the jersey, mm-hmm. and then like the nu- name and the number were different colors. I thought I always thought that was really cool. Um, generally, I liked. They recently had a gold alternate that had just the M on it, and it had the little Minnesota on it. I mm-hmm. liked that jersey a lot. Um, yeah, and uh, maybe and maybe the Mayasich ones with all the weird the the like ho- horizontal striping with uh, uh, I like those. Yeah, yeah. The, the Minnesota arch across the chest. Those are kind of classic. And I like those. That's the one hanging in the rafters right now at Mariucci, and that's a pretty cool one. But uh, I think the worst one has got to be. Um, yeah, no yeah I just got to. Ta- I got to take a look at a few the, the of these. The Hankinson era. <laughs> there's a, yeah, um, yeah. The the sort of little papyrus font looking. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 97 alternate. Yeah. And then the the, the soccer jersey with. Uh, with uh, what is this? The diamond with the Minnesota in it. What is it? I don't get it. Like put it on, put it up there in the chest, or like put the Minnesota, and then put maybe a C or an A in it, or something. With when like on the like, captain, that would be cool. Yeah. Put the just a big old Minnesota C A like these. That that's yeah, that, so that, that that's favorite. cool. I mean, to me, that's cool. It's classic. In the back, the nameplate looks really cool. Um, the maroon ones look a bit overly maroon, but you know what? I think I like the white one certainly. And uh, um, yeah, most recently the uh, uh, the M jersey that is sort of. Uh, uh, the gold base, which uh, they just ceased to use this year, which was the yeah, yeah the Minnesota in the collar. That pissed me off. Yeah, yeah now they have they the that. they have the diagonal uh, gophers in gold now. That but, also uh, pissed me off. <laughs> they took they took two really good looks. Mm-hmm. I I don't know if this is a Bob Motzko thing, which makes me dislike him, but <laughs> this pissed me off. They took two really good jerseys, the gold one with the, the block M, and mm-hmm. then it had the state of Minnesota on the collar where I'm like, NHL jerseys have the NHL crest. Sure. That was a very good jersey. And then they also took the my favorite gopher jersey, the white jersey that has gophers running diagonally down yes. the front with the maroon and gold stripes on it. They, they took that made it a hybrid. and then they dumped gold into it. It's yeah. a hybrid. What do you say? It's a hybrid, essentially. Now, now there's the fake laces on the collar rather than the Minnesota. Yes, fake they do laces. have the, sick, the classic '60s skating goalie on the which shoulders, I love. which is which is a, a good a good move. Ugh. But <laughs> I gotta say the stripe. I mean, it there's it has it has all you want for in terms of a of an of a old time hockey theme mm-hmm. to a hockey jersey, which Minnesota teams like to do a lot, especially recently. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a hybrid. I can I it, it's it's grown on me a little bit, but it, yeah, it's definitely different from the two distinct ones they had in the past. And uh, um, yeah, just the the simplicity, the balance on that one's really nice. And uh, 
Yeah, it's just something I liked. And I actually really liked their Hockey City Classic jerseys the second time around, the ones with the 50s Minnesota Arch, where it has almost the same template as the new uh, new Golden Gophers one, which uh, I, I really liked that one because I, I believe I was at that game too. It was pretty fun. I, uh, I'm i also not a big fan of what they did redesigned. With, with the home jerseys. Yeah, the first major redesign in over 10 years for the for the Gophers' home and away jerseys, like, which they had done. They had tinkered with it a lot in the two, in the like the 2000 to 2008 mark, but ever since from 2008 on, they haven't done anything really with it until it was, this year. It was fine, and I didn't see the need to change, but they did, and now it's like I, I just feel like there's too much going on. Yeah, on the shoulders and on the the stripe at the waist, like mm-hmm. there's too much going on there for me. And, and yeah, they just they really emphasized gold a lot more than than they had in the past, yeah, and they're, they're are, really similar to the women's jerseys now. If you look at the the, the what the women are wearing over at Ritter, they're they have very similar now. Yeah, and they, they have like a really sets. cool gold alternate as well. I love their gold alternates. It's, it's, it's a very re- good they, set. They have a really good. Uh, They've done they've they've done a really good job generally at the, with the uh, the hockey jerseys on both men's and women's side over the years of making consistently good jerseys that uh, look great out on the ice. Did we lose you? You have that deer in the headlights look. A little bit, yeah. All right, it's it's not not to sound like Tom, but <laughs> sorry, I, it's okay. I, I, you guys got really fired up about gopher jerseys. At yeah. some point, I had to get this out there. Like I turn on the gophers, and then I see the new jerseys, and I get angry. So I had to put that out there finally. <laughs> So, and then lastly for Drew, as we ask this to all of our guests, we we ask for your Mount Rushmore of hockey jerseys. Oh. So, or do you have a do you have a very specific favorite? And if you're like Ben and I, and you seem to fit in with our taste, so we know you can't pick one. So we give you the option of picking four, four of your very best. If you, um, if you got to be buried with four of your favorite jerseys, what would you go down with? <laughs> um, even though I know like, I would, <clears throat> I want to start out with the one I posted on Twitter She's the other day. Um, it's not exactly the one that I'm an absolute huge. The, my, that's my favorite of that team, um, but the North Stars, uh, what right? in Madonna era to yeah. the re- the black rebrand, the, the Norm Green sure. rebrand. The one that I have, what the green the one with on the. It. It's really. They took, the 19, sev- they took the yeah. 1972 through 78 one and added black. Yep, yep. And then added the North Star, the same logo on the shoulders. Yep. Um, that's my favorite North Stars jersey. It's my we, favorite jersey. We tweeted that from the podcast account that the North Stars up until the 92 black jerseys was an incredible history of hockey it's jerseys. Very good. It's yeah. very it was good. very good. Yeah. And then ever since, it's been mm. more shit. Yeah, I'm, pretty much. <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> I'm not as much of a fan of the one that uh, the one I was I was wearing that the other day, which was the the like the '70s version. Like I think you probably would put Dino Cicerelli on the back if you thought of anybody sure. in the in the era. Yep. Um, the unfortunate part, if I were to put a like get a name stitched on the back, I made sh- I need to make sure I'm era appropriate. Sure. Like and. My parents are telling me, "Oh, put Madonna on the back." I said, "He never wore that jersey. No. He, I can't. I can't in good Gilles conscience Malosh. put that name on it." Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Don Beaupre, put that yeah, on there. Yeah, there you go. Who um, yep. um, nanny? No, he doesn't think he's been before. I don't him. think he would have worn. He, would he have worn that one as a player? Which one are we talking about? The bl- black? No, the seventies, mid late seventies. Or mid, yeah, late seventies through early eighties. Because he was already up oh. in the front office. Where, where, Sorry, Craig Sands Hartsburg. Black. It was yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. That would Craig be Hartsburg. yeah. That would work actually because he was. I mean, he was a captain most of that era, wasn't he? Craig Hartsburg was a very good player. There you go. Yeah. All right. Um. Yeah, but uh. Yeah, that's then that North Stars jersey is probably my all-time. Um. I really. If you ever on uh, Chris Kramer's website, oh, I, I've, I, I wanted spent too to, much time there. I would uh, right. I would have loved to see those those unused black alternates on the ice with the Brad Maxwell uh, name on the back with the <laughs> oh it looked Lord. like a rainbow of gold to green to black. That would have been fun to see, maybe in practice kind of thing, but yeah, um, would have been fun to just see if how that turned out. But so they had North Star jersey is number one. I might you might not like this, but. <laughs> It has to do with another defunct team. Sure. The Hartford Whalers. There's nothing wrong with like that. that. Yeah, that's a but good. it's not the green one. It's the blue one. Really? You like I like the, the navy? blue one with the. I mean, that's a good. It's a good, it's a good jersey, it, but it's. It added I don't the gray, know it's as good and I think as the gray made it look. They made it look more defined to me. Really? Okay. I liked the blue and the gray, and I mean, even though that's it did still it touches the green, I know uh, I was a big fan of the 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 blue one. 
It's not. Um, I know. I. It's definitely not as purist because everyone. Oh, the the green one's the one that happened for the longest time, is and uh, it's the one they're bringing back for the Hurricanes this year, with along with Brass Bonanza, which is even the better news. Um, <laughs> yes. But. I, I don't know why I just really like that one. It looks really cool, and uh, I mean, some I've, I've for some reason one time I watched back the the Whalers last game at the Civic Center with John Forsland on the call. Um, to be honest, that's a that's, okay. that's a Mount Rushmore a broad, of NHL bro- TV broadcasters, by the way, John Forsland, yeah, um, who's still really doing like Canes the, who's still doing Canes games, um, but yeah, so that that's probably all on the list. It's definitely it's not my number two. I'm not gonna number them but uh it's, it's on the mount rushmore um in terms of uh, what could i say current jerseys um, I mean, you can go anywhere yeah oh boy um i think the i got it for just classic sake the red wings since it hasn't okay. really ever changed no um especially with i mean it helps with the those those that dynasty in the 90s um, that kind of helped them. I mean, with the, uh, I envision that jersey with Brent, uh, Brendan Shanahan's name on the back, or uh, Steve Eiserman, Sergey yeah. Fedorov. Fedorov was the one that I would do. Yeah. Um, any of those, any of those guys, and yeah, Eiserman is. Well. Don't you mean uh, Steve Eiserman? Uh, I wasn't around for that, but I've seen it back plenty of times. <laughs> um, I feel like you're you're trying to get at <laughs> Tom right now through really? me. I mean, yeah, okay. make Tom mad, not me. <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, that is, I think the Red Wings one is up there, but that would also be tied with me for another uh, descendant of the North Stars, the San Jose Sharks. Uh, it might not be, it's not that, jer- it's not their original jersey. It's not the inaugural jersey. It's the era that came after that with all the, the, 90s. Like, the circular yeah, yeah. deals on them and it had the cool like that joe thornton's first jersey yeah, yeah, yeah yep. um i really like that blue one i i i think i have one and it's just like it's it's really cool and i hate what they did yeah that one um great for audio with the one me just pointing yes, to a yes, computer that screen. one <laughs> um, that one listener at home the but 1998 to 2001 yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it was the, the re- first alternate and, and especially with the, the reebok rebrand oh, when they added all the gold ugh, just it yeah. bugged me the, all the orange yeah. yeah so that's definitely the third one on the list uh and the red wings would probably have to take i think it's gonna have to sit one spot off the mount rushmore <laughs> because i'm gonna come back with um an, uh, a jersey that uh a few players that played for the Avalanche back in the day mm. are familiar with uh, the Quebec Nordiques. Um, mm. it's blue a good one. It's a good one. with uh, the fleur de lis yeah. on the back. Um, that looked really cool. I mean, original Owen Nolan, Joe Sackick kind of days. I would like to get a Peter Forsberg. That, that would be that would be very cool. He played uh, there as rookie. Peter Stasny as well. I believe first yeah. two three seasons Forsberg was with the Nordiques. I think so, somewhere around there. Yep. Um, either way, though, those those are beautiful. Um, yeah, and funny, th- three of the three of my four teams in the Mount Rushmore are defunct. Yeah, it's kind of how it goes. Yeah, yeah it's kind of how it works. And, uh, yeah, yeah, but it, they they looked good, and uh, I'm v- I'm very I'm very happy to uh, own at least one of those, <laughs> given them the, given that it's the North Stars. So, um, I mean, usually that's what people go with, unless you're Craig Custance, who just tosses out a green <laughs> Thrasher's <laughs> jersey. <laughs> <laughs> he wants a St. Patrick's Day Thrasher's yeah. jersey. Ugh. <laughs> so, he, I, he's not a jersey guy, and, and that's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, he was just, it, He wanted it more for the rarity sake of it because it's like that jersey yeah. existed once. How know? about the Desert Coyotes? All we time. talked about that two weeks ago, yeah. and uh, I literally made our – It'd be our, cool to have just to – I know. Yeah, have. it's pretty gross. It's kind of like the Burger King <laughs> oh, jersey. That, oh, yuck. Which one are we talking about? The green coyotes, the the oh the yeah. peyote yeah. and the peyote the, the Kachina fever. era. In your face, yeah. space coyote. Exactly the <laughs> the fever dream jerseys. Uh, yeah, those would be fun to have. Just just to yeah. kind of have. Same it. with the Gordon's fisherman. It would be yeah. cool to have. Yeah. Not necessarily to bring back the wild wing jersey. That's a that's wild the wing mythical be unicorn for heart. me and Giles. Yeah. All those weird alternates the ducks had. Yeah. Yeah, they had many, many alternates. Culminating in that they nasty black and dark purple one. Yes. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, let's go old time, but not really. Yeah, throwing okay. some eggplant, though. So, yeah, that's my that's my top four. North Stars, uh, Nordiques, Whalers, or, well, yeah, Whalers Blue, and uh, San Jose Sharks te- uh, 90s Teal. Okay. All right. And then... Uh, so, 
we do ask this to some of our guests who have covered the wild, so I will ask you this, Drew. I've covered two games of the wild. Yeah. I'll have, I'll so have you know. You've been a no. pinch hitter <laughs> for the Pioneer Press. Yes. Do you have any great like behind the scenes stories of the wild you can share? Oof. Like like I mean for instance like How Evan, was catering for instance? Evan Spohr talked about how Ryan Suter once fed him after Yom Kippur <laughs> yeah. or um oh. Chad Graff had the great story where they ran into Briz yeah. randomly at a Pittsburgh Him bar. Him and Russo ran into Briz at a bar in Pittsburgh, and he started going on about Ukrainian politics. <laughs> yeah. Wow! And I mean, I, I mean, you're so not it's a lot to live up to, yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I haven't right. had that much of an. Uh, I don't think I've had that much of a behind-the-scenes experience. Um, really, getting there, sort of getting my feet wet into the. It sort of, I was there with Dane a few times, and. Uh, um, who's down the Viking speed, by the way, but uh, just uh, getting to it. it was a preseason game. The Wild, I think, yeah, thumped the Avalanche. It was a 7 nothing game. And then I covered uh, the regular season, the, the Hurricanes game, where <laughs> Svechnikov had, like, four, like three, four penalties. Um, it was Charlie Coyle did really well in that game, I, th- I think I remember. But um, I don't know. It's fun to see Bruce in his uh, in, in his own it's fashion. Uh, yeah. It's fun to it's fun. I mean, even when the camera's off, he's the same kind of guy, and it's just kind of neat to see the rapport he has with some of the reporters. True. Um, but I think general background was cool when uh, I was, I was doing, I was there not for the Piney Press, but I was there for my uh, my normal my daytime job at the Minnesota Daily. Um, I was covering uh, over the summer. I was doing a development camp, and I was doing a story just on the like, Gophers that were at the development camp, which at the time it was Jack Sadick, Tyler Sheehy, and uh, mm-hmm. now star goaltender Matt Robson who got an invite um, so I was talking to all those guys and uh, uh, esteemed uh, Lakeville North alum esteemed uh, current Mizzou uh, he's not really at Mizzou right now because he's covering the lightning in uh, at the Tampa Bay Times Nick Kelly, Nick Kelly. Uh, Lakeville North I made the mistake of call- saying Lakeville South once and I did not I didn't hear the end of it but um, no Lakeville North uh, he was there doing a story on a couple of products of Lakeville North and it was pretty cool to see <laughs> it was fun to see that dynamic with uh, Jack Jack Sadick being one of those guys sure. and the, sort of the Lakeville North connection and how 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 many uh, uh, Minnesota connections are on are in this development camp and in the wilds right. uh, they do a lot of inviting local deal anyways teams. and especially yeah. like I even see it now with the Gophers too I mean I think five of their six regular defensemen are all from Edina yeah and three of them played on the same team <laughs> yeah <laughs> so <laughs> um, yeah I guess the the West Side takeover is continuing as uh, it as it has in the in oh, recent years on all, the high, on all the hockey teams. All right, your last question all for right. you. This is our most <laughs> outstanding question we have to ask to everyone on this podcast. All right, is a soup a meal? Oh, <laughs> I knew I should have prepared for this one. Do your homework. Yeah, <sighs> you really should have known. If it's Campbell's Chunky, yes. If not, no. Ooh. I don't know if that's... That's a qualifier, and I know it's very bad yes. in a, in a, a yes. binary no. debate. No, that's a yes. No, but if I were to eat yes. like one of the, the hamburger Campbell's Chunky, I'd say, you know what, that's enough. Same with me. Like We do this thing in, in the Daily Newsroom as well. We do, we, do some, we do have a debate of the week. Like I think two weeks ago, it was, is salad a meal? And that was uh, that was one of the most highly contested ones we've had in a while. You don't make friends with salad. You don't make friends with salad. See what I said. I mean, <laughs> if you run into me anywhere, odds are I'm definitely not going to be eating a salad. Sure. At almost any point of the meal. Okay. But I said it is a meal depending on the size. Yeah. It like if it's an Elaine Bennis kind of big salad, you know what? <laughs> it's a meal. But if it's like something you open with. If it's if it's something you get at like a steakhouse, it comes on a no, saucer. No, yeah. no, no, no chance. That, that's the great no. thing I think about the soup question and and yeah. about the salad question. It, there's a lot of debate because there's so much gray area. Yeah, I mean, there's really uh, there's a lot of qualifiers it, you can put on, and that's what like, makes it, it depends fun. on the restaurant and the way they offer it. Like sometimes, like sure. yeah, they order, they offer super salad as a side or yeah, at yeah. A, like a deli. It's like okay, it's a side. It's definitely not a meal. But right. with in the same spec, uh, I guess respect to that argument. If you got the sandwich on its own, when the restaurant offers a side of a super salad, is the sandwich alone a meal? Yeah, I think sandwiches. I just are complicated the entire thing a meal. for you. I think sandwiches are pretty recognized yeah, as a meal. Yeah, that's by what I would think too. But like, if you is look at the argument, like, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Brian Reynolds put on my Facebook today that a sandwich is a taco. Yeah. Complete Wait, mind a sandwich well, is a taco? No, I, I've or seen it. Or a taco it. is a hot sandwich. Dog. I've seen a hot dog is a taco. I, what so did I've I say? Seen, you, you said you said a sandwich is a taco. Right. So it's a hot, hot dog, dog is a taco. taco. Yeah. A hot dog is a taco. Which I mean, when you look at construction, that's correct. Sure. Yeah. But yeah. I accept I've, that. So my brother sent me a grid, and it's one of those like uh, um, chaotic to neutral kind of grids <laughs> of the sandwich hot dog sandwich debate. And it's very good because it, it, it really kind of it, it depends on how law lo- you know how mu- how strictly you're following the guidelines of what is a sandwich and. It, the chaotic end obviously goes pretty bananas with that, where like I think pop tarts are involved or something, and uh, so so yeah, it's it, it gets it can get hairy. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I wasn't a help on the soup as a meal. I, I no one ever is. That's yeah. the joke. No, so. that's that's the that's, best, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the fun. Everyone hums and haws. Except for it. Craig's Custons, who oh. absolutely just like anti aircraft <laughs> shot me out of the sky. <laughs> I mean, he just like you know, it was like a fifty millimeter shell, just boom, <laughs> just no. Or, yeah, it was yes. It was of course it's a meal. It's like oh, sorry to offend you, Craig Customs, with our yeah. soup question. That that was the best day. It I know. Was, I, it was my birthday. I know. I, it, and I it, it was like work. a Wednesday too, wasn't it? I, I was left to work. <laughs> to oh, you record. worked and I recorded a, a podcast on yeah. your birthday. From work wow. To record that podcast with Craig. Yeah, and, and Tom only, was in the studio with and you. And not only did we get Craig who uh, was promoting his book at the time, but he just straight took a dump on <laughs> that <laughs> question. Like, <laughs> and, he and, didn't even hold and I was, It was midweek, so I'm on the road. I'm in an uh, unused office at our Phoenix branch, and I'm, <laughs> I'm Skyping you and Tom, oh, and gosh. he just absolutely lights up the question. I'm like, <laughs> I can't, like, I'm not even there yeah. to See, to even <laughs> defend it with Tom and Giles. That's, so. that's, I'm, I'm on my way to getting to that point where I can just lay it down on the line <laughs> on every podcast I'm on. I'm, I'm not t- that experienced you gotta get yet to Craig this Custons point. Level, I, need, yeah. I need to, to reach peak Craig Custons. <laughs> that, was, that was before Craig had his own podcast. True, it was. So, there you go. He got his start on Giles yeah. the Bully. <laughs> there you go. He yes. got his podcast started. <laughs> Cutting uh, his I teeth. hope it's in his Twitter bio. Had, yeah, of course. He had the ESPN on Ice podcast. What, what? That was like it, that was in his in-between. Yeah, I was going to say, we era. got him kind of in-between yeah. ESPN and The Athletic. Uh, I thought anyway. like. Enough quoting about Craig Custance. Right. But, all right. Uh, Drew, before we uh, let you go here, do you have uh, – Anything you want to plug, or where can people find you? Um, I'd love to plug uh, right now, although it's uh, a little bit dormant right now, the Minnesota Daily, my, no- my normal job uh, along with school. Um, just a lot of student journalists, a lot of us, I mean, we're all in between. You, you, most, of the, most of us are usually in between 18 and 22 years old working there and just sort of jumping into full-time journalism without a lot of experience. And uh, uh, we do a lot of work over there that's just uh, sort of learning by trial by fire, and I I'd really appreciate everything we do over there, not just from a sports standpoint, but we also have a great sports desk coming back for the spring, so I'd love if you check it out. All the go for sports coverage there. Um, you can find me at Minnesota Hockey Mag, actually. It just came out uh, a couple, I think, yesterday, um, the the December issue. Um, we I, have, I think I have a pretty cool story on uh, Emma Stauber, a uh, Duluth native, uh, she played for Duluth, or what was it, Hermantown, uh, Proctor, and Marshall when that was a co-op for high school for girls. Uh, she played at UMD during, right at the end of the Shannon Miller era, um, and now she plays for the Whitecaps in the the uh, one of the best team, best new teams in the uh, NWHL. So um, I talked to a little bit, her a little bit about her uh, her hockey life generally, and as a part of the Stauber family. I mean, just a, a bona fide uh, Minnesota original kind of family there. Um, so yeah, I'd appreciate it if you go check that out and the rest of the good stuff that uh, uh, the guys Scott Tiffany and Brian Halverson uh, wonderfully put put a lot of effort to into uh, all every uh, every month here for a pretty comprehensive issue. So um, I'd appreciate it if you go pick one up or go check it out. Cool. And you can find me at Cove Drew on Twitter. Sometimes I have hot jersey takes. Sometimes you might agree with me. I will also echo that. Uh, pick up a copy of Minnesota Hockey Mag. <laughs> sure. Or subscribe to Zone Coverage. Is that, that's that what too. I meant to say. There you go. Zonecoverage.com slash subscribe, promo code GATG20. But, uh, thank you to Drew for finally joining us. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd love to be on any other time. We'd love to have me. 
And uh, it's great because we really let the Jersey segment run extraordinarily oh, long. Yeah. Oh, crazy long. And oh, yeah. uh, if Tom comes uh, knocking at our door, we can just uh, blame it on you. So tomorrow yeah. afternoon Tomorrow at look for a, look for a 30 s- in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Look, look for, yeah, early early morning, late morning. Look for a small mushroom cloud over the North Loop <laughs> area as Tom had, Tom's head explodes. <laughs> It depends he'll, he'll on when Tom wakes up. Sometimes it'll be like right smack dab, yeah. 7 a.m. I hear from Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a, it goes a little bit into the afternoon. So um. You see, he'll have to get someone who listens to the podcast to actually tell them what happened at the end of the podcast. Cause, <laughs> wow. I mean, he, he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't listen, fi- he doesn't live fa- listen past five minutes in. Oh, jeez. No matter what podcast it is. Just throwing haymakers. Yeah. If only Tom were here, he would be better. <laughs> we so. miss you, Tom. Uh, thank you to uh, to Drew for joining us. Um, this has been fun. We will uh, we'll have you back uh, for some more uh, for more Jersey talk because uh, sounds we can great. Continue to go on for for days. Yes. Um, we could give a detailed uh, Jersey by Jersey, team by team description. I think and we can rate all those next time. Next time there's a huge rebrand in hockey, we'll we'll have you on. There we go. We had uh, we had our own individual podcast for that. Um, and yeah, like I, he said, you can find him on Twitter at Cove Drew, um, and then uh, you can find Ben and I on Twitter at Ben Remington at Giles Farrell. We have a podcast Twitter account at GATG Wild Podcast. Uh, we uh, again write for Zone Coverage, ZoneCoverage.com/slash/subscribe GATG20 to uh, use the promo code. Uh, and then uh, Drew is also part of the Gopher Hockey Podcast with our uh, great and esteemed guest, uh, Nate Wells. Nate Wells um, now now living in New York City. Who actually, who actually also asked the question of uh, who is the uh, best at Gopher Hockey Podcast guest. That's a terrible Which, uh, question, Nate. Yeah, That's a really loaded question. On. I don't feel comfortable answering that question. Yeah. That, that just feels like that gets somebody's dog out. It's definitely not Tom. We know that much. <laughs> ben, we're going to have to have you on one of these days as well. Yeah, yeah. We'll, have, we'll have to have a dual podcast. Because right. I know, I know we've, had, we've had Giles on before. We need, it. We need to get the yeah. full scope. I joined for the Go for Hockey podcast the day before Don Lucia. That's down. right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. That was that. a whirlwind week, wasn't it? Yeah, I Ooh. remember that now. Good stuff. Wow. If you guys just have a dull week, we don't have nothing to talk about, have me back. And I will just go on for a half hour about the redesign of the Gopher jerseys. Yeah, you guys can point to pictures on laptops. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do this a lot at, over yeah. at that Gopher Hockey Podcast. We do a lot of stuff that's not fit for audio. In the cupboard under the stairs studio, we'll just point at our laptops and say, here. Um, yeah, so that is the, uh, obviously that's the promo that leads into this otherwise fine podcast is for the Gopher Hockey Podcast on its own coverage. Check that out. Uh, and then Ben and I also have a YouTube channel where we throw uh, some uh, great hashtag content for you. Uh, search Giles and the Goalie on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to the show, iTunes, leave us a rating, SoundCloud, uh, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify. Uh, we, are, we are everywhere. So everywhere. Check us out there. So again, uh, thank you so much to Drew for joining us. And we will chat with you again uh, next week. Later. It's not resiliency. You're making it sound like we're good. That's all. I'm done.